Welcome to the second episode of the Wood Academy TV Breakfast Tray Build. We're all aware that woodworking is inherently dangerous. You can get injured doing it if you're not careful. That's why you need to read, understand, and follow the rules in the manuals that come with your tools. And as important as the safety glasses are that you put over your ears, and the hearing protection is that you use in your ears, it's what's between your ears that is your best safety device. You are your own best protection. Now in episode one, we resawed and prepped all the stock. We created all the individual pieces, glued up the top, turned the legs, made the rails and stretchers. In this episode, we're going to start putting it all together. We'll assemble the rail pieces together as a unit. We'll assemble the legs to the stretchers and assemble those as sub-assemblies. We'll create the spring mechanism and then we'll put the whole thing together, make sure everything works the way we expect, take it apart, finish it, and then do the final assembly. So let's get to work. Now the first time I built one of these trays, getting this rail assembly glued together, as you can see when you fit the joints, they want to kind of go off of square. So what I found was that the easy way to do this is to actually set everything, get everything put together, set onto the tray itself, and then clamp through the holes in the rail, the side rails, I can clamp everything together, line it up where I want it to be, where it's going to end up when I screw it all together later, I can line that up now, and with a little bit of wax paper in each corner, come back a little bit there, now this will be held in the alignment that looks good on this tray. It's parallel to the edges out here, parallel to the back here. It'll glue into place, and then when I go to assemble all of this later, everything will work the way I want to. So all I need to do is make sure that these joints are as tight as possible, let the glue dry, and then we can move on to the next step. Stack the legs with the best sides facing out, then mark them so you know which faces get grooved for the stretchers. The mortises will be cut on the router table, but you're going to need a sled to keep everything square and straight. Nothing complicated here, we just need to support the narrow foot so that the top is held square to the router table as it's being cut. Don't try to cut the groove in one pass. Making a couple of shallow passes will give you more accurate results. So mill all four legs at each setting, raising the blade in between sets. The flush trimming bit used to shape the rails left rounded corners in the bottom of the notch that the spring will fit into. But squaring them up is just a couple minutes work with a handsaw and a sharp chisel. Now the tenons can be formed on the ends of the stretchers. A dado stack is set up in the table saw to make a half inch wide cut. The tenon needs to end up a quarter of an inch thick to fit the slots in the legs that we just cut. So the shoulders only need to be cut about a sixteenth of an inch deep on each face. The bottom of each tenon is then removed to accommodate the round end of the mortise. Again, a good handsaw makes this quick. Over the years, I've gotten into the habit of cutting my tenons just a little bit too thick on my machines and then using a shoulder plane or a sharp chisel to adjust the fit until it's perfect. 
Taking the time to hand fit each connection like this really pays off in tight fitting joints that don't come apart. And now the two leg sets can be assembled. This just requires a little bit of glue in each of the mortises. If your joints are good and tight, go easy on the glue. You don't want to have to clean up a lot of squeeze out later. And carefully clamping the parts together so that they're straight and square. In order to attach the rail sections to the body of the tray, we're going to use screws coming up through the bottom. But because these rail pieces are all at a 15 degree angle, the holes that we drill through the base have to be at a 15 degree angle. And more importantly, and more di the more difficult process is to drill pilot holes up through into the rail so that the screws will go into the rail part and hold it but not come blowing out the other side. There's a trick to that, and I'll show you how to do it. Clamp the rail assembly on top of the tray body the same way that we did when we were gluing it up. It should be set so that there's an even overhang between the rail and the tray edge all the way around. Then use a sharp pencil to trace the perimeter of the rails on top of the tray. The screw locations are now marked on top of the tray and located along the center line inside the tracing of where the rail goes. These marked holes have to be drilled through the tray from top to bottom at a 15 degree angle. A scrap block cut to a 15 degree angle on one end will help guide your drill bit to give you consistent angles. These first holes are going from top to bottom and the 15 degree angle is toward the outside of the tray. Once all the holes are drilled through the tray, clamp the rails back into place inside the lines that you traced earlier and flip the unit over. Now the pilot holes for the screws are drilled through the tray and into the edges of the rail. The angled guide block is still being used, but it's been reversed to maintain the proper angle for the drill. Now the bottom of the tray needs to be countersunk at each hole location. These need to be at the same 15 degrees. So again, the angled block is used to guide the drill. Here's a little pro tip for you when using brass screws. Now, if your screws are steel with a brass coating, that's fine. But these are actual brass. They tend to be a little bit soft. If I try to drive them into a hole that's not exactly perfectly piloted to the right diameter and depth, I could snap this screw off. It's relatively soft. So I'm going to start with a number six steel screw. And I'm going to drive that into the hole using a hand screwdriver so that I don't strip out the hole. But what I'm doing here is kind of pre-tapping the hole with the steel screw. It's not going to break off, but it is going to cut the threads I need. And now I can either drive the brass screw by itself or get a little paste wax, put it on the threads. That's going to help. And now I can drive my brass screw in and it's going to largely follow the threads that I've already cut with the matching steel screw until I've got it good and snug. And I can do this for all the brass screws on this project and not worry about breaking them off. With the holes all drilled and countersunk, the rails are attached to the tray using number six by three quarter screws. Using a hand screwdriver instead of a driver drill ensures that the screws go in, fit snug, and don't strip out the holes. The legs are connected to the tray using four one-inch brass hinges. 
clamp a hinge to the inside top of each leg, drill a shallow starter hole, and then screw it in place. The screws for these hinges are tiny, so you'll want to be careful as you work. Position the legs properly on each end of the tray bottom and mark the pilot hole locations using the hinge. There's no room for the drill to drill the pilot holes with the legs in place. And finally, everything is screwed into place. The hinges being on the inside corner like this are a little hard to get to. A number one long bladed Phillips screwdriver really helped. A number of variables go into exactly where the spring block gets positioned on the tray bottom and exactly where the shoulders need to meet the stretchers in order to make the spring the right length. Now the spring block itself needs to be centered side to side on the tray bottom, but front to back it actually needs to line up with the notches in the stretchers. And so the easiest way to figure that out is to kind of center your spring stock on the arches that lead into that notch and then we can press that down, set the block so that it's centered underneath that front to back, and then mark it out. Now for the, for the spring itself, it's cut to 22 inches initially and that's a little bit oversized, which is fine. We can strike a center line where it's going to meet that block and then forcing the leg out, leg assembly out as far as possible, mark the notch there, make sure this one's out where we want it, mark the notch there. Now we have the shoulders and then there'll be a profile for the tab on this end. Now we can go ahead and complete the spring, glue the block in place, pre-drill and screw the spring in place and see how everything works. The spring block is simply glued onto the bottom of the tray in the area that we just marked out for it. It's held in place with just the glue. I didn't want screws showing on the top part of the tray. And again, be careful about the amount of squeeze out that you have to clean up later. The ends of the spring have to be formed to fit into the notch that's in the stretcher between the legs. The plan set includes a printable template that's mounted to meet up with the shoulder locations you marked earlier. First, the shoulders that form the tab are cross cut into the part. Then the tab is cut to shape following the printed template. This could certainly be done on a bandsaw with a quarter inch blade, but every shop ought to have a good quality coping saw and it makes short work of this particular task. Once both ends of the spring are cut to their proper profile, they can be sanded out. If it's been made properly, the shoulders of the spring should just fit between the stretchers of the legs when they're fully open. With the spring properly set in place, pilot holes with a countersink can be drilled along the center line through the spring and into the block. The final detail on the spring is to round over all the edges, top and bottom, using a 1 8 inch round over bit. Now the spring can be screwed into place on the tray. As before, the spring will be held in place using brass screws. So a steel screw is used to prepare the hole before the brass screws are secured in place. Time for a function check. 
Lifting the tabs on the end of the spring should allow the legs to fold. And when folded, the spring should rest on the stretchers, keeping the legs tight against the bottom of the tray. If the spring is too loose, you may need to shave a little off the top of the spring block. If it's too tight, you can add a couple of shims between the block and the spring. It will be easier and you'll get better results if you disassemble the tray as far as possible before finishing. Simply take it apart in the reverse order that we just put it all together. The spring is removed first. Then the hinges are unscrewed from the bottom of the tray and removed from the legs themselves. And yes, storing your hardware in a small bag will save you a lot of time and aggravation later. And finally, carefully remove the screws that hold the rail assembly to the tray. Once the tray has been disassembled into its various sub-assemblies, all of the parts can be inspected, cleaned, and sanded as needed. Now here's another pro tip for you. While I am certainly no expert in finishing, I have learned a few things over the years. I typically use water-based finishes in my shop. The modern formulas are very good, they're very durable, they're a lot easier to clean up, there are a lot less fumes to deal with, I just like them a lot better and I use them. But the real difference between water-based finishes and other bases is that the water in the water-based finishes will raise the grain on your parts after your first spray and do it quite a bit. So in order to help prevent that, what I've come up with is pre-wetting the parts. I've just got a little pan of water here and a brush and I'm going to simply wet the parts with some water and I'll do this with all of the pieces that I'm going to finish. I'm just going to wet them down not soaking them, I don't want anything to warp or twist, and of course you've got to do both sides as you're working, and then just wipe off the excess, and just keep wetting. It's very much like applying a finish, a wipe on stain for example, but in this case we're just wiping on a little bit of water, which will allow the grain to raise naturally on its own, and then I'm going to sand the parts to final finish after they've been wetted. And that means when I start actually doing the, um, when I start actually applying the finish, there'll be a lot less grain raising to deal with in between coats of finish. So after pre-wetting like this, the finishing process becomes pretty much the same as if you were using oil-based finishes from that point. Try it. You'll find it useful. Once the water has finished drying on all the parts, they can be sanded. I prefer to sand to 120 grit before beginning to apply finish. Now, each part receives a light top coat. I'm using a turbine HVLP system that does a really good job with the water-based finishes. I'll start by spraying the bottoms of all the parts, let them flash off, then spray the tops of all the parts before sanding everything in preparation for the second coat. And of course you don't actually even have to use a high-end spray system. Wipe on finishes and even rattle cans, when handled properly, can give excellent results. From here on out, it's just the usual round of apply the finish, sand it smooth, 
wipe it down, apply another coat of finish. I tend to prefer using Minwax Polycrylic when I'm doing my water-based finishes. Gives me a durable finish, but most importantly, I can lay down several coats a day because it takes less than an hour to dry in between coats. And because this is a breakfast tray, it's likely to have hot coffee on it, get spilled on, that sort of thing. You're going to want a good coverage on it. You're going to want to lay down several layers. Don't try to go for thick. Many thin layers is always preferable to a couple of thick ones. Once you're satisfied with your finish, and it's had plenty of time to dry, your tray can be assembled for the final time. The only real trick here is getting the screws started in the rails through the bottom of the tray. It's easiest if you start with the two screws at the front of the side rails. Start the screw through the tray until you can feel the point coming through. Then align that point with the hole in the rail. Don't try to force things. You want the screw to find the hole naturally. Once these two screws are secured, the rear rail can be shifted left to right just enough to get the screw started in the center hole of the rear rail. These three screws will locate the rail in the proper position. The rest of the holes should automatically be lined up with the pilot holes in the rail. Then the hinges get reattached to the legs. and the legs to the tray bottom. And the spring is once again screwed to the spring block on the bottom of the tray. And one final function check. Make sure that everything opens, closes, folds the way you expect, and that there's no rattles. This has certainly been one of my favorite projects that I've done in a long time. And I hope you've enjoyed following along in the build. Now, if you'd like to build this project for yourself, a complete set of plans is available for free on our homepage. It includes measured drawings, photographs, material lists, everything you need to make your own version. Now the next project on Wood Academy is going to be this book stand. I use it in my reading room at home. I have a bookcase where I store all my antique woodworking books and I can take one out, set it on the stand here. There's a shelf to keep it in place. In this case it's holding my iPad. But I can use it to read and research without having to squat down at the bookcase. The top pivots to set the reading angle to what I want it to be for my own comfort. And it can be used as a stand-up desk with a tablet or a small laptop if that's what you want to use it for. The focus of this project is laminated bent wood parts. The legs at the bottom, the stretchers here in the center, and the semicircular parts that allow the top to pivot are all made from strips of wood laminated together around a form. I'm going to show you how to make the forms. I'm going to show you how to laminate the parts. I'm going to show you how to clean them up and ensure that they're identical after they're laminated. So even if you're not planning on building a book stand, the laminated parts are highly useful on a wide range of woodworking projects. It's a technique you'll want to know.